Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, who is our ransom, as Isaiah prophesies, the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's always nice when sorrow and sighing flee away, isn't it? Most of us may have awakened today with an ache or a pain, maybe a sad thought, maybe something else on our minds that was bothering us in one way or another. Certainly when we are conscious of our sins, we can look at those with sadness and sorrow. But what about this ransom part? Immediately, Isaiah is likely talking about what's going to be happening in the near future in Judah. He is warning the people to repent, and they are not repenting. He is warning the people of the impending doom, and they are not accepting that warning. He is telling them, sometimes quite directly and other times a bit more obliquely, about the Babylonian invasion that will be there. They've already lost their northern neighbors, the kingdom of Israel, and all that's left of the chosen people is that area that sprawls around Jerusalem. Most of Judah there with bits and pieces of Benjamin absorbed in, some of Simeon had become part of it, and then, of course, whatever Levites remained. Of the other tribes, though, not so much. And Isaiah is telling them that it's going to be bad for them also. The only difference is that the Lord has kept his promise so far, and he will continue to keep it, that out of this line will come the Savior, which means somebody in Judah has to remain. Somebody in the line of David has to remain because that's where the prophecies have been pointing. But right now the prophecy is pointing to them being hauled off into captivity because they have been and remain wholesale enthusiastic sinners. People who not only shrug at God's law, but actively go against it. People who it seems sometimes are looking for ways to offend God. They're building their own altars in their own places. They're not coming regularly to temple. And when they do come, it's more of a show than it is for some of them an actual repentance for the forgiveness of sins. They offer their sacrifices and they go home feeling just fine without ever thinking why it was that that animal was sacrificed to begin with. Well, there's a lot of exceptions too. There are righteous remaining in Judah, but they'll be swept up along with the wicked at this time. And they will be carried off and for 70 years, they will be in captivity. And in that captivity, Daniel will prophesy and will have that marvelous story of the three men in the fiery furnace who are joined by the fourth, of Daniel in the lion's den, other parts of scripture. But they're not in their homeland. They can't sing their songs joyfully because they can't find any deep and abiding joy. Ransom these days we normally think about just in terms of a kidnapping, right? You take somebody and you tell their family to give you a bunch of money and they'll give them back. In some parts of the world, ransom and the company kidnappings are big business. When you go into parts of Latin America and get away from the safety of one area and all of a sudden you find yourselves swept up by people who want to make money off of you. And it seems like a lot of times they know exactly how much somebody is worth and what the market value is. If you or I were taken, probably we wouldn't fetch near as much as some of the people. So maybe they'd even skip over us and hope for a better target. We might find ourselves in that $1.99 markdown bin. and We don't want to have that low a thought about ourselves, do we? But ransom is more than just in terms of a kidnapping. A lot of times 
in days gone by, when prisoners were taken by a certain country, they didn't want to feed and house them. And if they were feeling at all merciful and kind and not wholesale slaughter-minded, they wouldn't just out of hand kill them all. They would ransom and parole them and send them back to the side that they had come from with the promise that they wouldn't fight again. If you're a Civil War buff, you'll find many instances of that where Union soldiers were sent back north or Confederate soldiers south with the promise not to fight, sometimes with a payment, sometimes without. But then we look at ourselves. Am I a prisoner of war? Have I been captured by somebody and held hostage? Well, in some ways, yes and yes. We are hostages, captives in a captive world. We are prisoners by birth of sin, of death and devil. If you wonder about the sin and the devil, then look at the death. Because death doesn't come to the truly righteous person. Death is not the wages of the one who keeps God's law. But we are held prisoner, we are held captive, and we cannot free ourselves. Our pockets and our purses are empty. We can't go to the well because the well is dry. We can't fix ourselves, and no one can fix things for us. We hear in the New Testament how someone might perchance die for a righteous man. But who's going to ransom a bunch of sinners? Who's going to invest in a bunch of rebels? It'd be as if somebody kidnapped the entire southern United States during the early 1800s and offered to sell them back to Abe Lincoln and the Union Congress for X amount of dollars. Why would you want to buy back the people who were rebelling against you, who were fighting against you, who were trying to run away from you and seek your overthrow? Well, why would God do that for you? Why would he want to ransom you when you were born as somebody who wanted to be your own measure, establish your own value, be as important as you wanted? Most of us don't engage in really wholesale and gross sinning, at least in part because we're afraid of the consequences, but we don't truly do it in love toward God and the true righteous fear of him, not a cowering fear because that's not what we're made of. We would be lost forever. Evil would hold on to us until the end and beyond the end. But the Zion, which will receive the ransomed of Judah, the ones who the Lord will allow to come back in 70 years, is even more so the new Zion that will receive you and me. We who are captured by our own sinfulness. We are held prisoner by Satan. We who cannot free ourselves find our ransom fully paid. As we say in the exclamation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed of Jesus, who purchased and won me. He bought you. He bought you back. By creation, every one of us belongs to God. And he has that ownership on us even if we won't acknowledge it, but he doesn't want it to remain that way. Because if we won't acknowledge him as our creator, if we won't acknowledge him as the source and norm of all law, of all order, then finally there will come a time when God says, well, fix it for yourself and we'll find out we can't. But he fixes it for us. And he invites us to accept the ransom that is already paid. To leave our captors and come to the place of freedom. And finally, that freedom is the new Zion, the new Jerusalem, the everlasting church, the one portrayed as coming down from heaven like a bride, the one beautiful, holy, and glorious. 
God sent his son Jesus to pay for just that. Who purchased and won you, not with gold or silver, which is a pretty good ransom in most people's minds, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. How much is one drop of the blood of God himself worth? Let alone all the blood that could flow from his body. How much is one divine breath worth? Particularly when that breath says, Father, forgive them. Jesus paid what we sometimes rather flippantly call the ultimate price for you and for me. Not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous so he could make us righteous. Not for good buddies who always want to hang around God and always do his will, his perfect obedient children, but for a bunch of rebels, for a bunch of liars and cheats and scoundrels, for a bunch of people who will do good when it's good to do good, but will do bad when they can get away with it who are not beholden to God any more than they are to anything else in this world. And he wipes that slate clean and he says, you're mine. God buys you back from sin, death, and devil. He buys you back from yourself. He pays the price of every one of your misdeeds, every one of your undeeds, everything you've ever thought, said, or done, or left undone, that was contrary to his word and his will. You're completely ransomed and absolutely freed. And you now are invited to join all the other ransom in partying, in celebrating. The rents of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We're already ascending Zion in this train of freed captives. In some ways, as Christians, we know that we already live in the new Jerusalem. We are already citizens of the eternal kingdom. But yet we're still in this kingdom, in this place of sin and death and devil. But when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, when we keep our focus on where we're going to end up, the sorrows and the sighing, are much less distracting. And even when we wake up with bodies or minds that hurt, with consciences that are still at times plagued, he calls us to focus on him and to realize that in him we have complete release, already granted and then fulfilled in the resurrection. James talks about how you, who are his hearers, and you also now, have heard of the steadfastness of Job and seen the purpose of the Lord. Job faced so many things and yet trusted in God. Who knows what you're still going to have to face? And only you know everything that you have faced, how you've responded to it in your own heart and mind. But God asks you to be steadfast, just as Job was, to trust that his plans, his purposes are there for you so that you are not left behind, left out when the party fully kicks off. When the celebration, which is often muted, which is sometimes only half-hearted at best, becomes a full-scale party without end. Still already today, the banquet has started, the feast is set before you. You come to eat and drink the body and blood of the one who suffered and died for you, the one who ransomed you and brought you back from the spiritual Babylon and led you into his holy city. Branch office today, Peace Lutheran Church, Slater, Missouri. There are many doors, yet there finally is one door. God invites us into his house. Wherever his house may be established on earth, that we might finally enter his eternal house, which is established in the heavens and which will be revealed at the end. You are ransomed. You are freed. Somebody valued you enough to assign you the worth of Jesus' blood, of Jesus' life. And whenever you do start feeling sorry for yourself, 
rather than sorry for your sins. When you start feeling worthless, when you start feeling that nobody loves you, everybody hates you, guess you better eat some worms or however it is you respond to life in general. Know this. Jesus poured out his blood for you. Jesus breathed out his last for you. He took every slash across his back, every slap across his face, the jabbing of the thorns into his head, all of that for you. You are worth, in his eyes, everything that he was and is in his father's eyes. Such an extravagant ransom for such poor, miserable sinners. See how God loves you? Now how are you going to live? What love now will you show in response to God's love for you? Who do you hope to join you in the parade to Zion and the eternal kingdom that has no end? How will you love as God loved you and serve as Christ served you? And when will the celebration start? God willing, you're not waiting for the end because we don't know when the end will be. Celebrate now. Party like there's no tomorrow because finally in the resurrection there is no tomorrow but an everlasting today. And you're already by faith in that today. And God grant that you stay there, live there, and love there until it's revealed to you in life everlasting. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.